Be there in my vision. Well, that's kind of the ending of, of my sermon this week, which I'm calling Keep Your Focus from Joshua chapter 8, the back end of Joshua chapter 8. Don't know, does any of you remember the Veggie Tales? It was a cartoon type thing that told Bible stories in a fun way, and it was a godsend to me when I used to be a, a family worker and I used to do assemblies into 15 primary schools in Chatterton about 17 years ago. The, there was characters like Bob the Tomato and Larry the Cucumber and the rest of the VeggieTales group. And it was great fun and it was really, really popular in its time. The VeggieTales group were produced by Big Idea Studios, which was created by a guy called Phil Vischer, who wrote a book called Me, Myself and Bob. I think he's referring to Bob the Tomato. He told the story of his meteoric rise of the Big Idea Studios and then we ended up having to sell his studio and the characters he created due to bankruptcy. As Vischer looks back, he believes the loss of his company was due to the fact that he lost his focus. He was successful, he was selling truckloads of videos every day he started following his own plan, though, to become the next great animation studio, a bit like a new Disney, rather than waiting for God's plan for his life. In his defence, he wanted to make an impact for the gospel. And he was making an impact, but the fruit of the Holy Spirit was not growing in his heart and in his life. Fisher believes that it was God who took big idea away from him so that he could get himself back on track. Ironically, he later formed a new company called Jellyfish Labs. He named it what he did because jellyfish can't choose their, their own direction, their own course. They're driven instead by the tides and the currents. Well, Fisher now wants to be driven by the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, rather than success models of men. And he wrote about this in a leadership journal. The Big Idea Studios faced a problem that's very common, and that's a loss of focus. One wise man put it this way, in the Christian life, the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. In the Christian life, the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. Well, this morning we're going to look at Joshua chapter 8, verses 30 to 35, where we can learn some things about keeping the main thing, the main thing. Let's review. In Joshua chapter 7, we saw Israel struggle because Achan was guilty of looting Jericho after they captured the city. Israel went off to Ai, feeling cocky, and they suffered a great, a great defeat. Excuse me. After the sin was removed from the camp, Chapter 8 tells us of the subsequent defeat of I and the people's careful obedience to do what God had told them to do. At the end of Joshua 8, we read what seems to be like an odd account. Then Joshua built on Mount Ebal an altar to the Lord, the God of Israel, as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded the Israelites. So if you look at a map, you can see that Mount Ebal, and not uh, is some 20 miles north of, of I. From a military perspective, heading north at this time when you're just beginning your conquest doesn't seem so much like a good idea. However, if the Israelites had learned anything, it was this, to do what God tells you to do, not what you tell yourselves to do. If you look at Deuteronomy chapter 27, you see that they were given very specific instructions that Joshua carried out to the dot. In this simple account, we learn something important about keeping our focus. The first heading I give is, we must constantly be reminded of our objective. Israel had won a great battle, and now it was time to refocus. Moses had told them, when you cross the Jordan into the land your God is giving you, set up large stones and coat them with plaster. Write on them all the words of this law when you are crossed over to enter the land the Lord your God is giving you, a land flowing with milk and honey. 
just as the Lord, the God of your fathers, promised you. So in the Near East in that day, it was customary for kings to celebrate their own greatness, greatness by writing records of their military conquests on large stones. You'll see some in the museums in London. It was a way of advertising, proclaiming their power to all who would see the monuments. They were like huge billboards, really, pointing to their greatness. By writing all on stones, Israel was acknowledging that their victory didn't come from themselves, but from the Lord, and it wasn't through their own military might. This monument instructed those who were new to the faith. There were, ch there were children who needed to learn the ways of God. There were people like Rahab who turned to follow the God of the Hebrews. There were people in surrounding towns who would want to know about their God, the God of Israel, and the people to, needed to know the laws of their God. But this monument was also there to remind the people of Israel of what they already knew. Like post-it notes, what we stick everywhere to help us remember things that we might forget. This monument was a reminder to Israel of things they just shouldn't forget. I often read books on basic Christian teaching and Christian theology because it helps me to keep focused on the essential matters of faith. I don't know about you, but you can start going off, can't you, and, and losing your attention on the basics and the basic relationship we have with Christ. I suspect many of you have, have manuals and magazines and other things you read on a regular basis so you can keep sharp and up to date in your fields of work and so on. But we must do the same with our relationship with God. That's why it's great to read the Bible and pray every day. It's so easy to lose our focus. We lose sight of who we belong to, who we serve, and who knows what is best for our lives. And especially in times like these, in difficult times, it's so easy to lose our focus. Things don't go the way we expect them to, and we get discouraged, and we want to give up, and we want to run away. We may want to get out of a, of a relationship. We may want to resign from a, a job that we're in. We may want to run away and move to a new location. We may want to punish God by diving into sin, as dumb as it is. We, people do this. In the times of discouragement, we need to turn to the word of God. In Psalm 23, the psalmist talks about this, his complaining and being a brute beast until he returned to the house of God and regained his perspective. In difficult times, we need to do exactly the same thing. We need to turn to church and to the fellowship of God's people that's been, that's been tough with this lockdown, hasn't it? But that's why these services have been important for us to be in fellowship through technology and coming to read God's word together and study it together and encourage one another. We need to turn to the teaching of God's word. We need to read our Bibles. In times of hardship, we need to make sure our focus is in exactly the right place. But this loss of focus can also happen in times of great victory. We experience some sort of religious eye, perhaps. Our church or, or organisation or company goes through a period of rapid growth. Or perhaps we're given a position of greater influence. Or we receive some sort of public honour or acknowledgement. Or like Israel, we win a great battle. And it's in these times, it's easy to feel that we've gained the victory. The sense in that we can feel that we have everything under our control. We seem to feel that we don't need God's help right now because everything's onky dory. And when that happens, it means we've lost our focus. Here's a simple principle. There will never be a time when we have our faith totally figured out. And there'll never be a time when we have discipleship mastered. 
like an athlete that has to keep on practicing the fundamentals or a musician who constantly needs to practice the skills the believer needs to keep refocusing his or her life one commentator put it like this the community of faith is not an autocracy in which one person exercises dominion nor is it to be a democracy with all parties deciding together their common will rather the covenant community is to be a theocracy every person seeking god's intention and being shaped by divine purpose i think they're great words we need to recount these truths time and time again this is one of the reasons we worship every week and study the Bible hopefully during the week. We need to refocus. Secondly, we need to follow Christ is practical. Following Christ is practical in expression. The people travelled to the mountains of Ebal and Gerizim. The mountains are only 500 yards apart from each other at the bottom and about a mile and a half at the top. From the top of these mountains, you could see a great deal of the promised land. The two mountains also formed like a natural amphitheatre. The acoustics were per per perfect, really. A person could stand on, on one mountain and recite something that could be heard on the other mountain. The people were told to divide into two groups by tribes. One group on Mount Ebal was to announce the curses, and the other group on Mount Gerizim was to announce the blessings. You can read of these curses in Deuteronomy 27 and the blessings in Deuteronomy 28. As the Levites read the, each of the curses, the people on Mount Ebal would shout, Amen. Then they'd read the blessings and everyone on Mount Gerizim would shout, Amen. And if you look at the curses, you see that they relate to the behaviours of false worship, disrespect of the family. Issues related to injustice and the lack of compassion for the needy. A lack of integrity in our dealings. Sexual impurity. A disregard for the value of human life. Same familiar? Blessings related to family, health, prosperity and life in general. The things we're struggling with now. This is the answer to the question. What difference does it make? If I follow the Lord. Well, if you live the way God has commanded you, you will experience his blessing. We will enjoy life more fully if we live the way God has called us to live. If we don't live according to his will, life will be less enjoyable and you may even be experiencing his discipline. Throughout the Bible, we're taught that faith is active and not passive. True faith in God means obeying him, but also following him. Walking the walk and not just talking the talk. It's easy for us to think about being a believer. is really about knowing and believing certain truths. And theology is really, really important. But what you believe certainly matters. However, genuine faith is not just about what you believe but it's who you're willing to follow, who you're willing to serve. Those who truly follow the Lord by the strength of God's Spirit will do what God tells them to do. A person who doesn't follow may still be successful in the world's eyes, but they'll be empty within. We also, the way of salvation is through grace, not through what we do. This is one more lesson in the text, and it's seen in the, alt in, in the altar that was erected. First notice how the altar was built. It was built with uncut stones. It wasn't supposed to be some short piece. It was not about the altar, but about the sacrifice on the altar. There was a lesson for the people and for us. The way to God is not through the works of men. Understand the importance of balance here. We don't become children of God by what we do. But being a child of God changes what we do. 
Archaeologists may have actually found this or a similar altar and they've been working on it since 1980 on an excavation and, and revealed sizable remains of a large altar built on unhewn stones. The altar was, as was ascended by a sloping ramp. Numerous animal bones were scattered on the pavement of the courtyard that surrounded the altar. Another interesting thing about the altar is where it was erected. We're told that it was erected on Mount Ebal, the mountain from which the curses were to be read, rather than on Mount Gerizim, the mountain where the blessings were read. Why is that significant? Well, I believe it shows that the altar is for sinners. Jesus said, didn't he, I've not come to call the righteous, but the sinners to repentance. God has set the standard for our behaviour, but he knows that we're always going to fall short. James Montgomery writes, sorry, James Montgomery Boyce writes, it's interesting that a thousand years later, the Samaritans built their altar on Gerizim, not Eba. So when a woman of Samaria had told Jesus, our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is Jerusalem, she was pointing to Gerizim in John chapter 4 verse 20. Jesus responded by turning her away from the mountain to himself and his coming sacrifice. The chief characteristic of the Samaritans of that day and of our day is self-righteousness. The Samaritans would not come to God as sinners, confessing their need of a cleansing, substitutionary sacrifice. They came as righteous people. You see, God understands our situation and provided a sacrifice that took the curse we deserved and made it possible for us to experience the blessings of God. That sacrifice, of course, was the cross of Jesus. He took the curse that we deserved and made it possible for us to know the blessings of God. We call this an extraordinary gift. We call this grace. God's riches at Christ's expense. G-R-A-C-E Aren't you glad that God's provision of grace is not reserved only for good people? If that were the case, none of us would be made right with God. Practically, this means that no matter what you've done, you can find new life and forgiveness in Jesus today. The Bible tells us that if we will confess our sin with a repentant heart, if we will turn to Jesus' forgiveness and new life, we will be made clean and will become a child of God. Two sacrifices were offered on that altar, on altars. The first was a burnt offering. In this first offering, the animal was completely burned up. This was designed to pay the price of sin. The second offering was a fellowship or a peace offering. In this offering, some of the offering would be offered to the Lord and the other part would be eaten by the priests and the people. God acting somewhat like kind of the host or bread in, in all the communion. These offerings picture the fact that through Christ, our sin is paid for, the burnt offering. And as a result of this, our relationship with our holy God is restored. And that's the fellowship offering. I mean, think about a family conflict. Something offensive happens, offending family members. Uh, and the member apologises and perhaps makes some sort of restitution if needed. And the apology pays for the sin and removes the debt. However, the payment of the debt doesn't mean that the relationship is fully restored, does it? They might still not be invited over for, for dinner and, and could still be excluded from certain family gatherings. See, resolving a conflict and renewing intimacy are two different things. But Jesus does both those things. Through the blood of Christ, our sin is not only paid for, 
but our relationship with God is also re-established. So let's close with some questions for our personal evaluation. First, can I ask you, are you drifting? Are you drifting? Do you find that your spiritual life is on autopilot? You may be successful in the world's eyes. You may even be viewed as someone who's spiritual. I'm not asking about your reputation. I'm asking about your heart. Are you drifting? Are you growing in your relationship with God? Are you becoming more Christ-like in your behaviour? Do you hunger for God's word? Are you growing in compassion for the lost and the hurting? Do you sense God's hand guiding your life? If the answer to these questions is an honest no, then it may be time for you to take a trip to Ebal and Gerizim. It may be time for you to refocus your life and remind yourself to focus on the main thing, which is serve the Lord in gratitude. Perhaps it's time for you to re-examine your calendar and reorder the priorities in your life. We all need to do this on a regular basis. Are you watching this? Afraid that the roof's going to cave in on you because God knows the state of your life. Do you feel like you don't belong to the people of God because the sinfulness in your life? Do you wonder if God could ever love you or forgive you? Are you living in fear that, that people are going to find out the truth about your past or about your current? If so, you need to come to Mount Ebal and put your trust in the sacrifice made by Jesus for people just like you and people like me. A Christ follower isn't a person who hasn't sinned. It's a person who admits his or her sin and turns to Christ for forgiveness and new life. You don't have to worry about the roof caving in. Even though we're worshipping in separate houses, you're among people who understand the wonder, the amazing wonder of God's grace. Finally, are you a follower of Christ in name only? This account of Joshua reminds us that God's blessing comes to those who do what he says. If you find that your life seems to be lacking the blessedness from the Lord, take a good look at your own life. Check to see if you started to embrace the ways of the world rather than the ways of God. If you're ignoring some, are you ignoring some of his commands? Have you stopped seeking his guidance and counsel? Do others seem to have more influence on your life than God does? Are you so intent on changing the world that you've forgotten that your goal is supposed to be allow God to change you? Take a lesson from the veggie tales. Return to the Lord with your hands and your heart open. Align your life with God's word once again so that you can make the main thing the main thing once again and experience the rich blessings of walking with our great and glorious God. Let's pray. Loving Father God, just forgive us when we lose focus. But thank you for the reminder that you're a God of great grace. Thank you that you don't want to just forgive us, but you want to be in a relationship with us. Help us to live lives to your glory. Help us to serve you and worship you as you deserve with every aspect of our being. Help us to look to you for our needs and not to the world around us, we pray. In Jesus' name, Amen. Well, the next hymn we're going to sing, our final hymn, says it all in itself. Let's sing in Christ alone.